Hey everybody, this is Alex. Um, I'm going to do a more formal introduction in a second, but I just wanted to let you know that this week's episode is a mini episode. It was going to be longer, and then we realized there was a problem with a file. I won't even tell you who it was going to be because I don't. Um, we'll have another conversation with this uh, great individual shortly. But yeah, this is just going to be one interview. And next go round, we'll be back to a full show. So anyway, enjoy this. I'm recording this on the voice memo on my phone. Hopefully it sounds okay. All right, talk soon. Hey everybody, this is Nashville Demystified. I am your host, Alex Steed. Every week we try to understand the city better, a conversation at a time. Nashville Demystified is brought to you by Knack Factory, a commercial video and content production company with offices here in the city, and by We Own This Town, a collection of podcasts brought to you by Nashvillians. I'm going to keep this introduction brief because I'm recording it at the Ossipee Valley Music Festival and String Camp in South Hiram, Maine. Long story short, I've run a farm to table food program up here at this string camp and festival for nearly a decade. And so I flew back north for this specifically. Please excuse the fact that I am recording this in the 1970s Winnebago. And I imagine that you can probably hear the patter of rain above me and the stringed instruments will probably make an appearance at some point in the background. It's inevitable. Today is sort of a part two of our unofficial Ernest series. I talked with Justin Lloyd, who literally wrote the book on Jim Verney. It's called The Import Jim Varney, excuse me. Um, it's called The Importance of Being Earnest. Our first part, in which we interviewed Ernest writer Daniel Butler, uh, got lo- a lot of attention and love, and I really appreciate it. I appreciate everyone who reached out to tell me about how important uh, the character was in their lives. I talked with Lloyd, who is Jim Varney's nephew, shortly after I talked with Butler, uh, which you'll hear here. For those who didn't catch last week's episode and are somehow not in the know, super quick primer, Ernest P. Royal was a character created by Nashville advertising agency called Cardin and Cherry, uh, and he was used in various television campaigns. The character was a creator of director and ad man John Cherry, who hated Uh, excuse me, who based the character on a friend of his father. He was portrayed by Lexingtonian Jim Varney, who was living in Nashville and involved in performance and stand-up throughout the 70s and into the 80s. Through a series of movies and eventually kids' television series, uh, the character found national and even international notoriety and was for a long time everywhere. I talked with Jim Varney's nephew and biographer, Justin Lloyd, again, uh, over a line that was not incredibly ideal. Um, We tried to clean it up as much as possible, but please keep that in mind. Here is Justin. Well, thanks so much for taking my call. I appreciate it. Sure thing. I'm glad to do it. You you released this book a year ago. I mean, excuse me, five years ago. Is that true? Yes, in uh, de- December of 2013. Right on. And what, what made you take this on? Really, um, a few things. I think um, one was that I could see that there was still a lot of interest in Jim's life and a lot of Ernest fans out there. And I felt like... I was aware of a lot of things being a family member that, that they weren't and that I could, um, I wanted to find a way to share with, with the fans, things that I had, you know, and, and it started out just kind of like as video and stuff. I would post to YouTube. And, um, but then I thought of something, um, you know, much more comprehensive and I felt like a book was maybe something that I could put together that I was in a, a place where I could, interview people that I knew, family members and and some of his acquaintances, and then also do the research part of it and and then trying to compile something that I thought would really be um, comprehensive of his life. And what, I mean, what were some of the things, I'm sure that you had already known a good deal, um, but what were some of the things that that surprised you as you started to do the, the research for the book? Gosh, there was a lot about his his early work, all, all of the, the work in, that he put in 
the traveling he did, uh, trying to, you know, become an actor, uh, uh, you know, uh, as, as a young person and traveling to New York, you know, at the age of 18, um, you know, then going out to California uh, for a while and uh, while he was in his 20s and, you know, had some success out there. Um, but really all the sacrifices that he made and, and um, you know, like a lot of, you know, you hear a lot of that kind of thing. People move out to New York, become uh, waiters, waitresses and kind of living on on nothing while trying to, to break into the business. Um, so there's a lot of sacrifice that he made, um, a lot of work that went into uh, becoming uh, who he was. You know, I, I talked with someone today um, who was who was a writer um, on a, a handful of the movies and on the TV show. His name's Daniel Butler, and uh, he had said that he went when um, when uh, Jim Varney died. When your uncle when your uncle passed, he went he went to a uh, to a memorial. But there was like a public memorial, and then there was a family memorial. Mm-hmm. And he said at the family memorial, when he saw, when he sort of met all the family members, he felt like he was like actually meeting all the characters. <laughs> That's funny. I'm not sure what that would be. I know there, <laughs> there was a, there was a public memorial that was in, in Nashville six, uh, well, six days after he died there. Um, and I was there and I recorded a bunch of things from there and I posted some of those to YouTube. Sure. Um, I'm not sure what he's talking about. Huh in a family memorial i'm not really sure i don't know if maybe he was just thinking and (laughs) it could be my misunderstanding but it just sounded like as he met family members it was like he was like oh these characters are people you know (laughs) know? i wish we were that comfortable or 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 that uh you know that interesting i don't know (laughs) that um i think you know i've heard my mother uh talk about some of some of the, the characters he did as being uh, some of my great aunts, uh, <laughs> which have been his aunt, and, and then um, some characters that my grandfather you know, would do. I think it was a lot of it more, more people that he may, maybe had heard about, and um, especially from my grandfather uh, growing up. Um, and he kind of based these some of these stories on and, and some and some characters in his stand up um, on, on those because what what would happen is his early stand up. Uh, he would have a lot of characters because he was his standard really con- would consisted of being a storyteller, and so a lot of these characters then kind of had a second life uh, through the earnest, um, you know, TV shows where in the like the family album uh, TV show they they had in the '84, yeah, where where now they became uh, relatives of Ernest, but these were like the. Um, Lloyd Worrell, the the meanest man in the world. Yeah, yeah. He was known as Lloyd Rowe in the early stand up. He had been doing that character since he was like a teenager, really. So um, it can kind of expanded on to Ernest's family and so forth. So and then he was even the snake handler in the Ernest Saves Christmas. That was basically that same character, that meanest man in the world. How, so um, how, do you know how I mean, can you just give a quick a quick overview about about who, you know, who who Jim Varney was up to this uh, up to the point that he got to Nashville? Like you're, you're saying, I know a lot of people who might know about um, who might know about Ernest. They know the character yeah. and they know that they know the movies and they know the TV show and they might know some of the specials, but they might not know his background, you know, as an entertainer beforehand. I'm hearing about stand up and I know theater was involved. So just who, who was this person? Yeah, he I try to give a, a brief overview. He he had taken a few stabs at, at New York, basically. Uh, the way things were, um, what was happening out there is stars were like like Freddie Prince, uh, for instance, um, and Jimmy Walker from Good Times. You know, mm-hmm. they would get some interest in stand up, and then all of a sudden they were stars in TV series. You know, Good Times, and then uh, Freddie Prince uh, was Chico and the Man, and so he was kind of looking for that type of you know opportunity that never that never really happened so um but he had been in new york um a few different times doing stand up uh that catch a rising star which were freddie prince kind of made it big and and jimmy walker and um and then he ended up moving back to lexington 
Um, and then a friend of his became his manager. And this person's name is Joe Lyles. Hmm. And um, this was a for me to get a hold of this person that was also a friend of the family's. It was very difficult. And, and but he was a you know, he made really for me, he made the whole book for me because he was providing me so much information that really nobody else knew. He was almost like interviewing a, a, an ex uh, spouse or something. Yeah. Um, because they did live together for a while and, and, and they were very close. Um, so, um, Joe became his manager and really helped him motivate him and helped him, um, you know, with, um, his, some self-esteem, uh, and so forth, giving, giving him confidence in, in being a stand up and so forth and helping him with material. And he moved down to Nashville, uh, with him in the early seventies. So I didn't realize that he had been to Nashville, um, you know, earlier than I really had thought that knew about. And, uh, they moved in, in together. Um, he got him, um, signed to the William Morris agency. He was doing some stand up there in Nashville. And then he had first really, um, got to know, you know, John Cherry, uh, through, um, through that agency and, um, with his character, the Sergeant glory character in 1972. Right. So they were doing um, some commercials with Sergeant Glory for a while, and then um, those ran for a while. They went out to California, and from about they're there from about seventy-five to almost nineteen eighty, about five years, and that's while Jim was um, able to uh, get on some TV shows like Operation Petticoat, um, it, and uh, he but he was doing some stand-up out there at the Comedy Store. Um, what else was he doing out there? Um, you know, Fernwood tonight, he was getting on, that's a, uh, Martin Mull. Oh yeah. Very familiar. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, but he was staying busy, but, uh, their actor strike hit in, in about 1980 and, um, things were kind of drying up out there. And so he basically moved back to Lexington kind of, you know, broke. And, um, and then that's when, uh, he, um, kind of reunited, uh, with, uh, you know, Cardin and Cherry and, um, began, uh, the, the earnest with, uh, uh, an advertisement for, uh, the, uh, it was the, uh, what was the amusement park there in Bowling Green, uh, Beach Bend. Oh, okay. They were looking for, you know, the, 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 they didn't have a lot of money. And so they were just looking for somebody. And then the park at that time wasn't in really good condition. So they were just looking for somebody to kind of advertise the park without even really even being at the park. <laughs> and, and so they, um, they just came up with this earnest character and, um, and then it just, um, and those ran for a bit. And then once they hit with some of the dairies, like the, the purity dairy right. in Nashville, in uh, Pine State in uh, North Carolina, that's when they really started to take off with Ernest. But yeah, and they so had... and so they were doing these they were doing these like commercials here and then sort of shipping them to to regions. Is that is that what was happening? Like these were sort of these were regional commercials that were shot in one place. Pretty much, yeah. And, and what they started to do, you know, was just kind of go, um, you know, market to market, and, and you know, with that ever doing any national ads and they picked up you know very quickly they're very i think adept at finding out what the things they were working that what was working for the character and these were some of these things is simply by um uh, you know just by good good fortune i mean the fact that he's talking into the camera right. and it it was, which just was a, a very intimate kind of feel, you know, but they just did that because they didn't have the money for another actor. Right. But that ended up working, <laughs> that ended up working so well. And then the low cost and this local shoot. But what happened is, of course, you see this commercial in North Carolina, you're thinking, well, that's got to be, that's got to be here in North Carolina, you know, because look at the budget, look at, that looks just so local. And, but the, the local flavor of it made it so much more appealing to, you know, the, the whole trust factor and all this kind of thing. This didn't feel like some, you know, uh, you know, big ad is trying to some, you know, uh, what do you want to call it? It's, it's tr trying to um, be too slick and everything, right. you know, it's, it's very home kind of homegrown feel and everything, which is exactly, you know, what you want in advertising. You want that, uh, um, that comfort and that trust. And, so Ernest and, was like an influencer. 
really, yeah, <laughs> kind of, because in, 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 in John Cherry stated it so well, he's like, you know, that people would say, well, I may be at the bottom of the heap, but I'm above that guy, right. you know, and, and, and that's a certain, there's so many psychological elements there, you know, and, and that's in, and so, and they really, they picked up on that and they would go with that. And they, when they had public appearances, they wouldn't necessarily say that they weren't from the area they were at, you know, right, right. They, they, they wouldn't, you know, lie, but they wouldn't exactly say, because a lot of these areas thought that he was local, you know, whether it be Texas or Tennessee, North Carolina. And uh, it, it's really funny because you, you, you can go on the internet and, and a lot of people will say, oh yeah, he's from Oklahoma or he's from Tennessee or he's from... And th that's just how it, it turned out. That was really interesting. Well, it worked so well that, uh, you know, I grew up with the character when when he was obviously in movies and then in, in uh, television. Yeah. And I had no idea he was in Nashville. When someone brought it up on when I, I was looking for, for topics to cover uh, 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 on Reddit and someone brought up that it was all here, it struck me how well they pulled off him being attached to no region. Right, right, right. Yeah, so that was so well done, team. <laughs> yeah, well, because and one thing I pointed out in in the book that this was before the internet, so because you couldn't do that today because right. a funny it would just get uploaded to YouTube and then it's viral and then it's you're done. But you know they they could do this back then. It could they could basically just slowly saturate the whole country, just region by region or market by market and just keep that character going for years. And then that's basically what they did. Right. Right. Um, and so it was really, you know, they, I, I talk about it like the lottery, instead of taking the, the, the cash payout, they chose like the 20 year plan, you know? Right. Right. And so that, uh, that really worked well. But then of course, I mean, as soon as the first movie hit though, there was kind of like, there's your national. I mean, I think they realized as soon as that hit, then, then it, that, that's kind of over, but they've been doing commercials for, you know, five plus years anyway, the earnest commercials. So, you know, but, um, but all that psychological part of that was very interesting to me. And I probably, um, I don't know, maybe covered it almost too much in my book, <laughs> I, but I thought, gosh, even from an advertising perspective, I, I thought this, this is just something that had never been done before. And it really was interesting to me, you know, how they, they pulled it off. And I mean, that it, it interested me. So I would hope it was interesting the readers. So, well, it's interesting okay. that the, the person who, another person who comes up whenever I bring up, um, this character, especially in Nashville, cause I, I didn't realize again, there was a connection is, is Paul Rubens and Pee Wee Herman. Mm -hmm. Although what, you know, and I think it's because very specifically because there was like, you know, an, an, an earnest entertain, pardon the pun, but like an earnest entertainer who was, who connected very well with their audience and treated yeah. children well, right? Like, was, right. What, like their rapport with children wasn't, wasn't condescending. It was actually like lovely. And, right, right. and, and like, it, what, what, what's interesting, what's, what's different about what, what your uncle had done or what strikes me uh, that's different about what your uncle had done is they, they had commercialized that character so well for a decade before its popularity whereas like paul rubens was like it was an act and i'm not i'm not trying to diminish diminish what peewee is because obviously that was a cultural phenomenon as well but um but yeah had, they they had turned it into a very successful business for years before the film ever came into play oh yeah yeah what 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 was your uncle like he was oh gosh he he was just a lot different than maybe a lot of people think he was just very, like very cool. I mean, he, he loved to, um, he had a lot of interest. He loved, um, jewelry and knives. And a lot of times when he would visit us, um, I would a lot of see him around in the holidays. Cause he lived just North of Nashville in a town called white house, which is just like 20 miles north of Nashville. Yeah. And so, you know, I grew up in Lexington, Kentucky, where he's from. And so that's not a far drive. So he would, you know, it's not three hours. And so he would be home, come back to Lexington quite a bit, especially on the holidays. And, um, it, it was funny to see him as earnest and then, then also, you know, how he was in real life. But was that strange, uh, for you? <laughs> I imagine there was like, was it strange that like your uncle had like had a national exposure, but you knew him, you know, as you yeah. yeah, it was, it was, it was strange, but I mean, it was, I kind of grew up that way. I mean, I, I didn't really see him a lot, you know, him being out away in California and so forth. I didn't really see him a lot until the early eighties when I was about 10 years old. 
So um, he was famous, I guess, from the first time I really re- knew of him. And so I, I was always just, I guess, kind of used to it. And it was just kind of a surreal, you know, surreal kind of thing that, you know, here's this guy in movies and stuff. And then around Christmas, he's in my kitchen. Right. And it's just that. And, and so, yeah, that's just it's, it is. It's it's funny. So. Did you, when you said, when you said that you think you m- maybe went into the psychology too much in the book, <laughs> what, what, how, how do you mean that? Well, I mean, I, I looked at, you know, they, they talk about, I guess when you write stuff, write stuff that interests you. Right. And, and I mean, the, the, the advertising part of that, um, that's a psychology behind that was a big interest to me. I, that just interested me. I thought that that's, um, you know, so, um, uh, they're so clever kind of what, what they, um, what, what they did. And, um, I thought, gosh, you know, if you're, if you're in an advertising class, this might be a good book. These chapters just here in advertising might be a, a good, you know, kind of history of, 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 of certain type of advertising, you know, that, that I don't know how you could, you know, do something like that today, but, um, sure. I don't know, but I mean, but I tried when I wrote the book, I mean, I really definitely had, the Ernest fans in mind. I mean, obviously that's where all most of his fame came from. And, um, you know, and I know how people feel about Ernest and, and, um, I thought that, you know, that was, you know, quite a character. I mean, it went through the commercials, you know, TV with the, the kid show and, and all the movies. And, um, I wasn't, you know, because of my age in, in the eighties, I, I really wasn't, a, a, you know, a huge fan of the movies. I really didn't feel like I was um, in the uh, their you know, their focus uh, audience, you know, right. there. And, and so I was like 15 when the Ernest Goes to Camp came out. And so I mean, I liked it, but I like, I guess for me, I liked the, a lot of the commercials a lot more. I liked the Ern- the uh, the family album and all that stuff more. Um, but um, I, I definitely thought he w- w- did great with that character, and, and I can see. Um, so much of the talent that it took to pull off. Cause a lot of people think that, well, the commercials, gosh, you can just get in front of the camera and just say, Hey, Vern and do some silly things. And, and anybody could do that. But if you really look at the 30 seconds and what he has to do with delivering the lines <laughs> and all this, I mean, it is really like this, it's a real feat. And, and, um, and so, um, I really wanted to, um, kind of explain all that and, and how things, uh, came to be. And, and, um, and I, I definitely wasn't going to be some, you know, earnest apologist or anything like that. I felt like this, this was a, a really great character. I mean, it's really funny that he, you know, he got a Razzie award and I, you know, with the Razzie <laughs> yeah. awards, yeah. for Ernest goes to camp in 1988 or whatever, 87, 88 for the movie. And the following year he wins an Emmy <laughs> playing the same character right right you know for Ernest in right. a in a tv show I mean, you you get a Razzie and an Emmy in the consecutive years yeah. I mean so that kind of shows you what and it's just it's interesting because people feel like because of Ernest like it, it they feel like uh, I get a sense on the internet a lot of times that they think he's just this awful actor, you know, mm-hmm. and um, it's just, you know, interesting to me that how that is that because you play this, this kind of role that will, that anybody can play such a doofus or whatever. And they're just a, not a great actor. And so, well, he, the thing that, yeah. the thing that has been surprising to me in, in recalling this and sort of, you know, getting ready to talk with you and, and just talk mm-hmm. about the subject generally is that, um, I do feel like on some level anyone can, you know, act like a, a doofus, whatever yeah, that looks like. Yeah. But I, I don't think that anyone can do it with sort of consecutive and regular sustained success yeah. and and to do it in a way where, it, again, it doesn't feel condescending. It feels like it's yeah. like a, a relatable person. Mm-hmm. What was his take on all of this like what how (laughs) i feel like it must be surreal to go from doing this thing that's small and regional to uh something that's recognized across the country and 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 for some period of time throughout the world yeah i think i mean i think he he enjoyed it he enjoyed the um 
you know, he got a, he was able to um, do a lot with the character and playing the multiple roles in movies and things like that. I mean, I think he always probably looked at it as it could be a springboard to a larger movie career. And when he was able to do certain characters in movies that somebody would look at it and say, hey, we'll look at these different look. He can be a bad guy. He can be this and that. And and that's what I kind of felt with the family album, that it was almost like, um, you know, doing some kind of a, a screen test. It was some kind of a, a highlight reel that you would show to some producer to show this is what this person can do. I think he kind of looked at, at it at, in that way, too. Um, always kind of hoping that somebody would, you know, see him and, and think, oh, well, he can do this and that. And um, and I try to, I mean, it's easy to sit back and say, well, he should have done this and should have done that. And um, But you do look at, I mean, I, I think about, somebody like uh his his friend billy bob thornton Hmm. um when and i know it's very difficult of course but when you can go out and and make something for yourself when he was able to take that screenplay you know daddy and the uh, or i'm not daddy and them but the sling blade yeah and 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 then turn it into something um yes very difficult but if he hadn't have done that i mean you know I, i don't know what that really launched his whole career. He wasn't waiting for somebody to see him. He was, you know, making something happen. And, um, I, I don't know that, that if Jim had not tried to do something like that himself, you know, um, so I, I don't know, but it, it, that's hard to, hard to say, you know? Sure. Though it sounds, yeah. I mean, it sounds like he, like, it sounds like just getting a sense of like who this person was in, in Nashville, who was involved in theater and comedy, yeah. And, and turned it into, you know, t- turned it into, he turned it into not just like a livelihood, but he turned it into something that seems like he had a quite a bit of ownership over that a lot of people don't tend to have. And like, maybe mm-hmm. it wasn't, maybe it wasn't, it didn't have like theatrical acclaim. Um, yeah, cause it right. sounds like that was an interest of his, Yeah, but it, it's, I mean, it sounds like he had just an incredible amount of ownership in a way that, that a lot of people seem like they don't ever get the luxury of having. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, obviously he was involved with some of the writing, and, and I'm sure he would ad lib lines during movies and, and so forth. And um, so, yeah, and I mean, of course, the, the character. I mean, I know he he was after a while, he, understandably, he was typecast as that character, and it was it was difficult for people to see him uh, as other characters. And I, I can understand that. And so, I know that affected um, him almost uh, not getting the role as Jed Clampett. You know, right. Beverly Hillbillies, he, you know, he had to do a screen test um, for that. And uh, because the, you know, the executives there didn't really want him, but the the director of Penelope Sphere, she really did. And she really fought for him. And so he would, but he had to prove himself to everybody else. And so, um, and so, yeah, that was, that was good that he was able to get that role. That was, I thought it was a good, a good role for him. That's interesting. I forgot so. that that was Penelope Spheres who made that movie. That's, that's yeah. an interesting person to go to bat for you. Um. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Cause she had just come, you know, off of uh, doing a Wayne's world. Right. And right. So, yeah. Right. So, yeah. She was a big, and that was, you know, it's quite a movie, a lot of stars in that. And so how, what do you hear? I know that you, you have some contact with fans and, and that's sort of how you got into this. Like, what, what do you hear from fans that, that surprises you or, or just that you're happy to hear when you hear it? Just that they, um, they remember growing up with him and they, they, people that have children today like to introduce, um, him to their children and, um, you know, that's, that's very heartwarming. I mean, they were, uh, I think a lot of these are, you know, people younger than me, people that were probably more, you know, younger when the movies came out and were really affected by the movies. Um, and, um, and that's great because I know myself, I'm a huge fan of like, you know, Superman and Star Wars and, right. and I'm like, for them, this is like, you know, this is like their Superman, their Star Wars. And so that, to me, that really, when I was able to kind of make those connections right in the book, I mean, that, that gave me a lot of, of, of inspiration and, and um, you know, wanting to, to, to just do all I could to make it the best, the best book I could. And, um, and I just think, you know, sharing, a, you know, humor like that. And I, and I think of kids that had, you know, bad childhoods and things and think about, you know, finding something on TV that was humorous and uh, uh, somebody that felt like they were your friend. I mean, that's so powerful. 
And, and that was something else that I thought about, you know, that when I wrote the book that to, to give them some, you know, further connection to him and understanding of what he was like. And well, so those I, kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think about the fact that he just the, the, I mean, a couple of things, like one, it, it was like a sketch show for kids, which is, which is really interesting. And the other is that, um, you know, in, in the eighties, it wasn't yet unpopular to raise your child with television. And, mm-hmm. and so the idea, I, I think there must have been a good deal of kids who, you know, who Ernest, <laughs> the character, addressed them directly in a way probably yeah. a lot of adults did not. Yeah, I mean, just like Mr. Rogers, you know, I mean, very much like that, I think. Just address them, uh, adult addressing them, uh, you know, and, and making them feel you know, like, like there's somebody, you know, just talking right to them through the TV set. And, um, so yeah, I, I think that was the, how a lot of kids saw him. Yeah. What is, what is, yeah. what is the thing that you would like people to know about your uncle that, that they, they might not necessarily know? He, I know he, he visited, you know, a lot of, um, sick children in hospitals, a lot of places that he would go, uh, he, he would visit, I know, um, Diedrich, uh, Bader, you know, who was in Beverly Hillbillies yeah. with him played, um, Jethro talks about when he was out there in California, how he would, on his days off, he would be ch- visiting children's hospitals and things like that. He had a real, um, uh, he, I think he had a real love for children and, um, and just probably remembered how much he loved the, the theater and stuff as a child and, and, um, you know, wanted to give, give kids that kind of, uh, you know, entertainment. Um, you know, I think that's, and he never had, uh, really kids of his own through his, his, uh, his first wife, he did have two stepsons, um, that, you know, he was pretty close to, but then after they divorced, he, you know, he didn't live with them or anything, but he still kept in touch with, but he didn't, he didn't really have, you know, kids of his own. And so I think, um, a lot of the fans that, you know, when he would get letters and things that kind of, hope to take the place of that somewhat you know yeah that's very sweet how do people get uh, a hold of your book uh just through amazon uh basically um it's a you know a paperback and i've got um, an ebook there um so either one of those and i think it's it's also um on uh what's the other i'm trying to think i think it's mainly through amazon sure uh, so so yeah We'll we'll make sure so, that they can link to it accordingly. Sure, sure. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate I, it. I appreciate it, Alex. It's been great. And thanks for taking thanks for taking all the time to write the book. <laughs> <laughs> it's been well worth it. I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully everybody enjoys reading it. So awesome. Take care, Justin. Thank you. All right, you, you too, Alex. Take care. That's the show for this week. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much to Jesse LaFontaine for all things post-production. You're amazing. Please uh, tune in next week. Thanks so much.